maritime cruise ship passengers now spend exploring these strange and remote islands. That's how the Earth looked like a few million years ago. I thought that it looked like we were on the moon or another planet. The beginning of the Earth all over again. I really like that part about the Galapagos. Especially the sea animals really excite me. The seals, the turtles. Yeah, and you can be so close to them and yet feel free. And they can feel free. It's lovely. It is. was just a meter away from the penguins and just could observe them for five minutes or as long as I wanted. Darwin sailed on around the world, returned to England to live a quiet country life and never went to sea again. But the memories of the strange animals of the Galapagos continued to inspire him throughout a lifelong quest to solve the mystery of mysteries. The zoology of the archipelago will be well worth examining, for such facts undermine the stability of species. Darwin would spend the next 20 years examining facts, painstaking research, careful note-taking, in an effort to better understand what he observed every day on farms in the English countryside. He had made one of the first connections when he visited pigeon breeders. If God had created every form of life on the face of the earth, why was man able to breed such an odd assortment of variations? We have some 200 well-known and accepted breeds of pigeon. Some of them are very, very attractive. Some of them are almost ugly. But uh, everyone to their own type, and uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, of course. As Charles Darwin witnessed what domestic breeders could achieve, guiding the shapes of animals to benefit the beholder's eye, he became convinced that over time, environmental pressures might be having a similar effect. Selecting traits for survival that would benefit not the beholder, but the animal and plant species. He noted that change was not always of benefit to the newly born and the newly budded. These tumbler pigeons have been inbred to such an extent they can no longer fly. So they fly backwards, it's like um, backstroke almost in swimming. It's almost a reverse wing action. Um, it's usually a matter of clapping your hands or just stamping your foot and they'll do it. But once in a great while, the change might be beneficial. Darwin's genius was in imagining change beyond what he could witness in his lifetime. Imagining evolution occurring over eons on a vast time scale. He couldn't see the motion, but he could infer it was there, and he could work out the laws of motion that had brought all these wonderful shapes into existence, gradually, layer by layer, bit by bit, generation by generation. So it was all inference, and it was magnificent inference. Maybe the most magnificent act of imagination that a human being has ever achieved. On the Origin of Species by Natural Selection was published in November 1859. It sold out immediately. Conservative church officials were outraged, but many intellectuals embraced Darwin's dangerous idea. Thomas Henry Huxley, a noted zoologist, defended Darwin from attacks by the church. Huxley's life was changed when he read The Origin of Species in 1859, and he recorded in his memoirs that his first thought on reading the book was, how incredibly stupid of me! 
not to have thought of that myself. And I thought, this is a song cue if ever I heard one. Richard Milner should know. He has written a musical about Charles Darwin. Of course. Of course. It must be so. I should have seen it long ago. Twas adaptive radiation that produced the mighty whale. His hands have turned to flippers, and he has a fishy tail. Selections made him streamlined for his liquid habitat. Why didn't I think of that? There was an ancient mammal that could hop and leap around. With webbing twixt his fingers, he could fly right off the ground. And so this mousy creature evolved into a bat. Why didn't I think of that? Other scientists in the 19th century had not been able to think as clearly as Darwin, due in part to prevailing religious beliefs and in part to a failure of the human imagination. The human imagination is very, very limited. We are very, very bad at making intuitive guesses as to how long it would take to evolve something. Now that technology allows us to examine life in minute detail, we can observe evolution in action. And some of what we see is terrifying. Darwin's theory is quite evident in the AIDS epidemic. As millions of victims face death each year, we are brought face to face with evolution, visible in our own lifetime. The AIDS virus, identified in the early 1980s, has been changing itself at a horrifying and rapid rate. HIV evolves extraordinarily quickly, so it's on the far end of the spectrum of, of rapid evolution. And you can watch the virus evolving in the course of an infection with a single individual. The HIV virus is not very good at making copies of itself. Whether that is a flaw or a survival strategy, the result is deadly. The virus invades the human cell and in reverse of the cellular process creates two copies of its own viral genes called RNA. The result is a new double helix sequence often with mutations inserted into a section of the cell's DNA. The human immune system can't keep up with the rapid changes evolving in the machinery of its own cells. It's part of the reason we don't have a vaccine yet. This extraordinary variability that we're up against. Mutation, natural selection, change. We are surrounded by it. We can witness quick-time evolution, visible in the span of our lifetime, in progress right now out in the Midwest in places like Kansas. Farmers are fighting a war against pests that are ravaging their crops. Pests like wheat flower beetles. The battle weapons are pesticides used on a massive scale out in the fields and in the storage elevators.